well, uh, just the last month, I was in Delhi for a conference. And uh, as I was going from the airport to the hotel in a private taxi, we had a bunch of policemen stop our vehicle. Uh, they gestured aggressively with their stout sticks and angry, impatient faces. As the vehicle slowed down and the policemen closed in, I felt a very, very familiar but unpleasant trepidation. So strong is the conditioning of the Indian mind to react with anxiety to the presence or even the prospect of police that nothing seems to mitigate that fear, not even being a police officer yourself. Uh, in fact, this phenomena of a negative impression of police is not uncommon. In fact, it's the standard in all the post-colonial developing countries where the police was once used as an instrument of repression. When I say repression, the first thing that comes to my mind is George Orwell's book, 1984. It should be no surprise then, George Orwell's perspective was galvanized by the time he spent as an imperial police service officer in a district in Burma, then ruled as a province of British India. But that's not the story I'm here to tell today. I'm here to amend and update these pernicious portrayals that we carry about the police in our minds. I want to tell you the other side. So we'll start with some uh, myth busting. So myth number one that we probably all have in our minds, police in India is corrupt. Now, in fact, I Google searched the biggest corruption scandals in India. And the scandal sheet that I saw thereafter featured multiple departments of the central and the state governments, defense, land, urban planning, sports and youth affairs, animal husbandry, so on and so forth. But guess what? Not even one large corruption scandal in this country has featured the police department. <laughs> Think about that. Myth number two, the police in India is brutal and barbaric. But on a list of countries ranked according to the likelihood of getting killed at the hands of a law enforcement officer, India ranks very nigh at the bottom. In fact, statistically, you're more likely to be killed by law enforcement in Sweden than in India. Myth number three, police in India is inefficient, ineffective, and incompetent. Let's look at some figures here as well. The United Nations mandates 222 policemen per one lakh of population. In India, we're languishing around 138. As far as spending on police is concerned, the global average is about 2% of the GDP. In India, we spent 0.9%, less than half. Whereas on the Nambeo International Crime Index, as against a global average of 44.3, India does a tad better at 43.2. So with two-thirds of the strength and one-half of the budget, the police in India manages to keep our crime index better than the global average. Not too bad, I'd say. Myth number four. The police in India is low on conscientiousness. It's not very hardworking. In fact, as per a recent study by the Bureau of Police Research and Development, more than 90% of policemen in India regularly do overtime. Mind you, most of it's unpaid and uncompensated. No other department, in no other department does this figure even reach 20%. Uh, Sundays, weekends, holidays, Christmas, carnivals, festivals, all of these things signify celebration with family for you. But for the police, it signifies extra hard work, night duties, possibly in 12 to 14 hour shifts. Policing in India is not just a job with a limited set of defined activities. It's a responsibility with defined, undefined, and undefinable tasks. Think of, uh, myth. let's come to the next myth. Uh, police, uh, while the military protects the national security, the police concerns itself with only minor issues of local significance. Let me tell you that the security, the national security establishment of this country is actually led by the police. The national security advisor, Shri Ajit Doval, is a police officer. The borders of this country, the entire frontier, is guarded by the armed police, not by the military. All institutions of high value critical infrastructure are again protected by the armed police. The intelligence establishment, the domestic intelligence IB, the foreign intelligence RAW, the technical intelligence NTRO, all are led by the police. The special forces, the famous black cat commandos, the NSG, they're led by the police. The SPG, which protects the prime minister, India's own secret service, that's led by the police. In the war on terrorism in India's history, there are only two successful examples of defeating terrorism by sheer force in Punjab 
and in Andhra Pradesh, in both the cases, the effort was led by the state police. Even in terms of the ultimate sacrifice, last year, three times as many policemen were martyred in the line of duty as soldiers. So I hope some of these things have been revelatory for you. I mean, it certainly was for me when I first got to know of it. Uh, I'll take a moment to underline that I'm not uh, denying that there are numerous unmet expectations that the citizens of this country have of the police. As a police leader, I acknowledge all the lacunas that we have to address to realize the ideals of good and smart governance. What I'm, I'm, I'm not attempting to limit the discourse in any manner. I'm, I'm just contributing strands to it from my personal experience, which I hope will allow us all to see the full role of this essential institution that serves and protects our way of life in the largest democracy on earth. Now, I'd like to uh, share with uh, you some of the initiatives that we, the Prakasam District Police of uh, Andhra Pradesh Police Department, have been taking for a better tomorrow. First, I'd like to speak about uh, Project Spandana. Spandana means response in Telugu. So if any of you has ever visited a police station for any issue, you know that uh, it isn't easy to always get a prompt, satisfactory response. And if you're a woman, or if you're poor, you belong to an oppressed community, or you reside in a rural area, you face even more difficulties in availing police services. But if the police station staff knew that you had reliable recourse to a higher authority, chances are that you'd be well attended to the first instance itself. So that, in a nutshell, was the idea of Spandana, to make the SP or the district police chief accessible to public. Now, the SP sits at the headquarters in a district like Prakasam, which is the 10th largest district of the country by size. End-to-end uh, -end commute could be 600 kilometers. It could be six to eight hours. So there are physical barriers to overcome. I've already told there are socioeconomic barriers to overcome as the weaker sections face greater difficulty in availing police services. Similarly, there are administrative barriers we need to make the entire system available to the public. So the breaking barrier moment here came when we decided to do the entire public grievance addressal digitally instead of physically in a distributed, decentralized format using a live video link system which enabled instant on-demand access between terminals dispersed across the district. Uh, there was a little hiccup there, though. The market price, the lowest market price quoted for such a system was 1.5 to 2 crores. I've already told you that we spent less than 1% of GDP in law enforcement, so we hadn't the money and we weren't going to get it. So in typical police fashion, we improvised. And we put together for the entire district an ingenious uh, solution which involved essentially using old computer systems on the verge of being discarded, uh, some low-cost uh, accessories, some uh, uh, free-of-cost uh, softwares, and we had a working live video link system for 2 lakh rupees. That is less than 2% of the lowest market price that was quoted to us. And in the process, we became the first large district in the country to have all the police stations, police officers, and police offices connected onto a live video link. We then threw our doors open to the public. And uh, now, in Prakasam district, you can, on designated days, simply walk into your nearest police station, directly connect with your SP, state your problem, and get a definite resolution within 15 days. We then went a step further. We live streamed the entire process on YouTube and on Facebook. Why only serve the citizens? Why not engage them? And why not show them the government in action on their mobile phones for them to like, share, comment, and, and engage with it in a novel manner? We went a step further still. We implemented an app-based solution which enabled people from anywhere in the world, any location, to connect with us live on video and participate in Spandana. Just imagine this. You're living in New Jersey. You have parents back home. They have an issue. And now you have the option to reliably connect with your SP and seek any help. So we've been able to achieve a rare service standard. Ours is a service which is available everywhere in the district, which is accessible from anywhere in the world, and delivered on site, on time, on demand. Similarly, the next project we undertook was uh, Parivartan. Now, if Spandana was about reinventing citizen services, Parivartan was about re-engineering our own internal processes. 
The operational philosophy was the same, to do things digitally instead of physically, and to do it in a decentralized, uh, distributed format. So the processes we focused on was performance review and training. Uh, we moved from a system of monthly crime meetings. I mean, all over, the, all over the country, this still persists since 1861. So we changed that. We moved from a system of monthly crime meetings convened physically at the headquarters to a system of weekly performance review meetings conducted digitally. Whereas earlier, only about 30 to 35 officers would attend the SP's review. Only those many officers would actually regularly get to see the SP's face. Now we have 400 to 500 members logging in from different places and attending those meetings regularly. And for the first time, even the subordinate ranks, the head constables were able to participate in those because of the expanded capacity. Then, so far as the training uh, methodology is concerned, we moved from a system of predominantly physical classroom-based instruction to a system of virtual classrooms, where an expert or a resource person now, I mean, earlier it was, a, it was a big task to even convince a good expert or a resource person to come to Prakasam. We are a remote place. Uh, now he doesn't even have to come to Prakasam anymore. He can log in from wherever it is comfortable for him. And at a time, 300, 400 trainees consume that lecture online. Earlier to this, I could only train 30 to 35, a room full of people, that's it. It would take me about 100 training cycles to train my entire force of 3,500. Now I can do it in 10. And the economics of this uh, digital transformation is extraordinary. Just reflect on that for a minute. To enable all the 1.3 billion citizens of this country to reliably access the police services from anywhere in the world, the total investment needed in the manner that we implemented is only six crores. Even if you go for an upgraded version of the system with better microphones and HD cameras, etc., it still works out to only 60 crores, which, to put it in perspective, is about 0.00001% of the 75 lakh crores that the governments in India are planning to spend this year. Similarly, Similarly, uh, the savings have been tremendous. Uh, in uh, our district alone, we have been able to save 2,800 man hours of productive time, 50,000 kilometers of vehicle depreciation, and 5,300 liters of fuel every month. In monetary terms, that's about 13 lakhs. 13 lakhs per month on an investment of 2 lakhs. The entire investment just paid for itself in a week. And if this is implemented countrywide, we estimate the savings are going to be about 472 crores. To put that in perspective, 472 crores is 10 times the entire budget of 40 crores that was made available to us uh, for modernization of police in Andhra Pradesh government. The next project that I'd like to speak about uh, is Abhay. After the brutal incident of uh, rape and murder, of a young lady in Hyderabad. Our conscience was shaken. There was a palpable sense of grief and despair and an urgent concern with safety of women. We responded to that by introducing a first-of-its-kind facility which extended the scope of standard emergency services offered by the police. Abhay is an emergency drop home service whereby we rescue any woman in a difficult situation between 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. We, we attend to that emergency and we give her a safe drop home. So now if in Prakasam district any woman can call us between 9 to 5, we'll attend to her situation, any if she's stranded anywhere, and we'll drop her safe home. We were the first ones to introduce it and now it's been taken up. Thank you. We were the first ones to introduce it. Now I'm happy to say that it's spread uh, uh, quite like wildfire organically all over the country. It's uh, being introduced everywhere. The next project that I'd like to briefly tell you about is the SWAT. Uh, in the, the policemen you see on duty regulating the traffic or the ones you visit at the police station are not equipped to undertake high-risk operations. By that I mean scenarios where use of lethal force can occur. Lethal force can occur by the hostile actors or the criminals, or it may be necessitated for the police to use lethal force. For such situation in India, we don't have a system of a special weapons and tactics team in every district. So we decided to raise one, and after a gestation period of about six months, we was born the Prakasam District uh, SWAT team. 
It is the first uh, SWAT team in the country to have been entirely raised, trained, and deployed at the district level. And the example is also being followed elsewhere now. Uh, finally, briefly, I'd just like to mention about uh, another project we undertook, uh, Project TATA. TATA stands for Trainings and Activities for Technology Adoption. Uh, the government, contrary to popular opinion, is actually quite good at introducing technologies. Where it falls short is to truly adopt the technology in its day-to-day -day functioning. We discovered after a survey that only 10% of our force could operate all the police computer applications. So then we resolved to become the smartest police force in the country, which is to say, we'd like to be the first police force in the country to be 100% technology trained down to the last constable. So Project Tata is underway as a series of training programs and courses. And by end of June, we expect to have uh, the mission accomplished. Uh, I, have, uh, I hope I've been able to add to the narrative about Indian police. Narratives are important because we become the stories we tell ourselves. And the story we tell ourselves about the police will determine how the police is looked at, how it is felt, what it is thought of as, what it is expected to become. And therefore, it will determine what the police actually becomes. And we all have a stake in that. Thank you.